<clears throat> Matthew chapter 18. Verses 21 through 35. When you're there, say amen. 18. Twenty-one through thirty-five. It's called the parable of the unmerciful servant. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? That's the question. Up to seven times. Now, just, oh, children, you're dismissed. Did I not? I'm sorry. You're, you're free to go. Uh, <clears throat> seven is an important number in uh, Jewish and biblical history. Does anybody know what the number seven represents? Uh, completion or perfection. Okay, number seven. We understand that there was six days of creation and the seventh day God rested. That is the completed point of creation. Okay. So seven is a biblical numerology representing uh, it's finished, done, finished. So Peter's kind of asking Jesus here, he said, hey, how many times do I need to forgive my brother? I mean, until it's complete, until it's done, seven times, finished, boom. And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Therefore, my kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who, owned, who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. And since he was not able to pay, the master had ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had to be sold to repay the debt. At this time, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Boy, isn't that encouraging? That's encouraging, isn't it? Uh, it's really going to get encouraging when we understand a little later on what that means to us. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. Now, how many of you know gold's more valuable than silver? How many of you know a thousand is a lot more than a hundred? Okay, so we're on the same page, right? Hold him a lot less. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow, servants, his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all your debt because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Forgiveness is huge, especially in kingdom living. Today we're going to be talking about finding my gratitude in forgiveness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the day, and we thank you for the opportunity that we have to open your word, to bring it out, to examine it, to apply it, and let transformation happen. Let us see your truth. We pray this now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. There's a story that <clears throat> I was brought to mind when I was reading this text, and I know it's kind of weird, weird story, but bear with me. I think it'll make sense by the time we get through. 
in the end of it. It was a story that one of my favorite comedians of all time told. And y'all know who that was? Jerry Clower. Jerry Clower. Oh, the voice of Yazoo, Mississippi. He told his story, and I can't remember it probably verbatim, but this is the pretty well the crust of it. He, in 1987, bought him a brand new F-150 Ford truck. Another reason I love Jerry, he's got a lot of taste. <laughs> so he brought his brand new F-150 Ford truck and he drives to the airport because he had an engagement that he had to fly to. And he says, I got up on this aeroplane, and he says, we boogadied across the sky to the next stop. Did my engagement, got back on that aircraft and boogie doom back, got off and got in that brand new F-150 Ford pickup truck. And he says when he got in it, he said it was raining cats and dogs. I mean, it was just coming a flood. And he says, well, I'm just going to boogie on down this road and get on home and I'll be fine. And he's going down the interstate. All of a sudden, there was this gas gauge that come up on his dashboard. He says, well, surely I can make it home. So he keeps on going, trying his best to get to his destination. But it wasn't to be. Sure enough, he ran out of gas there on the side of the road on the interstate. So he gets out of the truck, and it's just raining. Sheets. I mean, it's so bad you can't hardly see your hand in front of you. And he gets drenched, and it's cold, just nearly a slush-type rain. He goes around to the back and looks in the back of that truck trying to find a gas can, not knowing what he's going to do. And that was before the age of cell phones, when it was so popular. So he sat there, and all of a sudden, this man pulls up a good Samaritan. And he said, that, he said, Mister, you having problems? He says, Why, I surely am. I'm about out of gas, he said. I'm out of gas. I need some help. So he puts him in his car, carries him up to the next service station. He buys a jug of gas, and he brings him back. And Jerry sent him out in the rain, and he pours this gas in just enough to get him home. He thanks the Good Samaritan, gets in his truck, wet and cold and miserable. And for the next 30 minutes, he grinds it out, and he gets home. Gets home, gets by the fire, undresses, dries off, and gets in bed and gets a good night's rest. The next morning, he gets in his truck and goes to the gas station. And he drives in and he goes, Ernest, fill it up. He said, yes, all Jerry. He said, both tanks. <laughs> he said, both tanks. He said, yeah, Jerry, in these new Fords, he's got an auxiliary tank back there in the back. He said, show me. He showed him where the other gas can, I mean, the other gas tank was. And he said, well, how do you know how much gas you got? He said, there's a button on your dashboard. He said, show me. He said, he goes in there and he hits that button. All of a sudden, that gas ain't went, whoop. <laughs> he said, here I have been cold, wet, and miserable with a full tank of gas stranded on the side of the road. <laughs> That's an operator. <clears throat> Ford engineered it where you had hope. But if you don't circumvent that hope, if you don't apply that hope, it ain't going to happen. That's another message. By the way, don't get me off today. <clears throat> that story is a funny story. I love that story. But it's so true in so many different ways about life. You see, we're stranded with full tanks of gas. We're at a place that we can't go any further, but yet the fuel and everything available is available for us to go and go further down the road and be more productive and everything else. But we just don't know how to access it. We just don't know how. Gratitude is a big thing. Gratitude is one of the defining things of our life. And I did a little research on, <clears throat> on gratitude, and, and it says this. It says, of all the attributes one can develop, gratitude is most strongly associated with mental health. Mental health. <coughs> mental health. I don't know about you days, uh, you, you guys, but in, in these days, you look around, there's a lot of people suffering from mental health, don't you think? I wonder if that could be because we don't know how to express or we don't know how to live gratefully in gratitude. Reckon there's a coalition? I don't know. We'll see. Gratitude is our, emotional, uh, is our emotion that relates to our ability to feel and express thankfulness and appreciation. Hmm. 
Gratitude is our ability to express thankfulness and appreciation. This researcher found that expressing gratitude improves mental, physical, and relational well-being. Just the act of gratitude. Gratitude, now this is interesting, gratitude reduces materialism. Do you think that's something that we have to suffer with in this country? Materialism is big, isn't it? Well, listen to what materialism do does. The problem with materialism is that it makes people feel less competent, reduces feelings of relatedness, and gratitude. Reduces the ability to appreciate and enjoy the good in life. Hmm. That's what materialism does. It generates negative emotions and makes them more self-centered. Ho, ho! I'm like Jerry now. Ho! Do we have this kind of illness in our society? Self-centeredness? You're kidding me. Hmm. Well, it says this, in positive psychology research, gratitude is strongly, consistently associated with greater happiness. Happiness. Gratitude helps people feel more positive emotions, relish good experiences, improve their health, deal with uh, adversity, and build strong relationships. People feel and express gratitude in multiple ways. Multiple ways. Multiple ways. <clears throat> Dr. Andy Yarborough did a search uh, or did a study and he found out that uh, gratitude can be a result of healthy rhythms in life. <clears throat> These healthy rhythms are often associated with eating well, sleeping well, exercising, and all these, those three major things have a prof profound effect on one's gratitude proficiency. Uh, positive, it has also has positive effects on our emotional health. Psychologically, it has positive emo emotions like, uh, the positive emotions like gratitude can guard against depression and move us from a poverty mentality to a provision mentality. Right, did y'all follow that or did I mess it up too much? Having, psychologically, having the, the, uh, the rhythm of gratitude in our life can guard us against depression and move us from a poverty mentality to a provision mentality. A poverty mentality is, oh, I can't never have nothing. Rick and Bubba does that all the time. That is a, a mentality, a poverty mentality. And it move, uh, gratefulness moves us to a provisional mentality, which means through Christ I can do all things. See the difference? Okay. <clears throat> gratitude, journeying, in other words, our journey in gratitude is a great way to nurture positive emotions and we can do this in many ways there's five different ways <clears throat> that he lists that can help us first he says journaling is a great way of finding gratitude write things down second thing talk about it share what you're thankful for with someone else third is meditate whether you regularly meditate or not, take a few times a day and meditate on things that produces some positive emotion in your life. This is him talking. Four, express that positive emotion. And five, seek gratitude postures in your life. In other words, intentionally designed this. Now, I'm going to unpack that. That was from a secular psychologist that they've been doing studies to try to figure this out for uh, many years. And this report just came out last year. Now, I want to bring you back to a study that was done 2,000 years ago by Paul and was written in Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. It says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. When do we rejoice in the Lord? 
And he says it again. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, presenting your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now listen to this. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about, in some translations say, meditate on these things. Hmm. Meditate on these things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, this is Paul talking about, or seen in me, put it into practice. In other words, seek it. Seek it. And the God of peace will be with you. Gratitude stems from intentionality. Gratitude stems from us being purposeful of how we live our lives. But it's rooted in the fuel of forgiveness. Guess what? Each and every one of us that has received Christ as our Lord and Savior has been what? Forgiven. Every one of us. That's the big tank. Forgiven. The question is, we talk a lot about, and, and I'll say the question, and let me define this a little bit more. But we talk a lot about, about forgiveness, about us forgiving someone else. You need to forgive your neighbor. You need to forgive your family member. You need to forgive that person that cheated you. You need to forgive that person that speak, spoke uh, bad of you. You need to forgive someone that is not kind. You need to forgive that rude person that pulls out in front of you on Highway 72 at Cambridge Lane. Not that that's ever happened to me. <laughs> but you need to forgive. We talk about forgiveness being proactive because we need to forgive, right? But the fact of the matter is, in the Matthew text that we read this morning earlier, talks about another responsibility that we have we often do not address. And that is, we have a responsibility in our forgiveness to handle it appropriately and to forgive. We forgive because we're forgiven. And we should have gratitude about being forgiven. And that gratefulness is what spurs us on, puts the switch on the tank to be able to give us enough fuel to be able to forgive others when we feel like we can't do it. And we don't want to do it. A lot of times we don't forgive people because we don't know how to receive forgiveness and we haven't received the forgiveness of God in its fullness yet. And thus we don't intentionally put rhythms in our life that would produce gratitude in our lives. We don't do it. We don't practice the good things of life. We don't wake up in proper times. We don't eat proper things. We, we don't exercise. We don't do these things that is our reasonable service according to God in the forgiveness that God has given us. We don't do these things. And I'm going to tell you, it makes a big difference. When I get up in the morning and I walk my treadmill and I do my push-ups and my crunches and all this other kind of stuff, that's what I do to maintain this body. <laughs> I feel much better. I'm positioned to be more grateful during the day. I really do. I can tell a big difference when I eat lunch at Dubs versus Panera Bread. <laughs> when I eat at Dubs, I go in and at 2 o'clock, I've got a sledgehammer hitting me on the side of the head trying to put me in the Z-land. <laughs> it's horrible. I eat at Panera Bread and I start skipping like a fairy. <laughs> Everything's light, clean food. I feel great. I might be exaggerating just a little bit, but still. I, I kind of feel that way. I position myself to feel better. And when I feel better, gratitude comes easier. And forgiveness comes easier as well. Gra gratefulness, gratitude is always coming from a point of being forgiven and offering forgiveness to others. It produces gratitude in your heart and life. 
I remember uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I had this big struggle. And I, I got mad at somebody. I got angry. Very angry. And I was to the point that I was going to take this person to court. I was going to put out petitions and say, do not hire this person. Do not let them own your property. I was so angry. Why was I angry? I felt like I was misused, abused. One of our construction sites, I felt like we were overcharged for something blatantly. And, you know, I tried my best to talk it through. And then after I couldn't talk it through and reason with them, I called a lawyer and said, hey, what kind of grounds do I have? And he says, well, you've got some grounds, but you know, it's, it's pretty, you know, meticulous in that way. You've got to prove this and he's got to prove that. And, you know, you probably do have a case. I'm going, okay. And so I call this meeting. And I call this meeting not to uh, exemplify the grace and mercy of God. I call this guy to have a meeting with me and his, his cohorts to exemplify the grace and mercy of God in a dagger way that would stab his heart plumb out of his chest. <laughs> so he would feel compelled. He had to do the right thing. I know I'm not alone. Don't judge me. Every one of you have done that this week and worse. <laughs> to somebody, maybe to your husband, I don't know. Hey, fellas, you be quiet. <laughs> Some of you might have even done it to your wife, but we're not talking about that. We did family matters last week. <laughs> last, last thing. I come in and I laid it on them, buddy. I'm going to say now, if you can sleep at night, and if you can really feel good about this, because this is God's money, if you can do all that, then I'm going to pay this bill. But I'm going to tell you, I disagree with it. I think it's wrong and everything else. And I think you acting nearly satanic. <laughs> he goes, okay, pay the bill. <laughs> I said, okay, we're done here. I get up, I go out, get the check, bring it back, pay him. I get back to my office. I sit in my chair and lean back and I had three or four people come in my office and I bit their head completely off. <laughs> Hello? Then all of a sudden, I get a phone call from my wife. And as my granddaughter says, it's when I talk to her, it's no, no, no. <laughs> I knew better. I explained to her a few things that was going on. And she said, well, I understand you're frustrated, but do you think that you were God honoring? I got to go. <laughs> Somebody just walked in the door. I hung up. I leaned back in the chair. When I leaned back in the chair, there was this dagger in the back of my chair and it went plumb through. My heart was dangling right in front of me. And it was black. It wasn't necessarily what I did that was wrong. Matter of fact, I did all the right things. But the reason why I did them were not the right way. It wasn't authored from the right source. It wasn't from a point of forgiveness. It was from a point of condemnation, revenge, spitefulness. God has got a better way. Because see, that stuff leads to anxiety. That stuff leads from me biting people's head off. That stuff leads from relationships being spread apart, split apart. That's what that kind of stuff, that's authored from the devil himself. And we get sucked in and deceived and we bite into it and we say we're doing something good. But it's something that's tearing us to the core. It's something that's robbing us from our gratefulness. It's something that we'll never get to the point of thanksgiving because it's at the core of our heart. It's black, it's defiled, and it's not of God. Amen. And it's got to come out. Intentional living means that I have to crucify my flesh. 
Sometimes daily, sometimes hourly, sometimes by the minute. And I hate to say that sometimes it's by the second. It's just, Gordon, what I'm doing. I don't think I'm alone in this situation. I don't think I'm alone. But I'm going to tell you, I see a lot of the stuff that Matthew is talking about in his text when he talks about us operating out of non-forgiveness instead of being operating out of forgiveness. I see the strife and the discord. I see anxiety. I see mental illness. I see all these things that is, that is bringing havoc upon us in this nation. And we live in the most prosperous nation known to mankind ever in the history of mankind. And yet, we're so anxious we can't see straight. We're so worried about stuff. We're so uptight. We're so afraid of relationships. We're so afraid of losing what we have. But God says that we have to lay down the cross daily. Lay down our life daily for Him. And when we lay down our life, gratitude seems to rise back up. Thankfulness seems to appear like the sun on the horizon on a stormy day. Hmm. My question, who I gotta go. My question is this, guys. There's two sides of forgiveness. There's receiving forgiveness, and there's giving and operating in forgiveness. And you have to do both for there to be balance. You have to understand how to receive forgiveness. And most of you do probably, maybe. But most of us hasn't got to the point that we can receive the forgiveness of God because we're too busy condemning ourselves. And we will not allow God's forgiveness because we can't forgive ourselves. And we put a wall between the forgiveness of God because our unforgiveness will not let His forgiveness penetrate. But once we tear that wall down, we start allowing ourselves to be forgiven. The forgiveness of God floods in and it allows gratitude to be known at a place and a source and a, and a way that we've never experienced. Or if we have, maybe it's been a while or a long time. And then after we receive that forgiveness, how do we react? How do we live our lives in the illumination of this forgiveness? We live our lives intentional. We live our lives with purpose. We live our lives to experience the joy and the grace and the mercy and the love of God. And we do that as we receive it and as we give it. You're a product of what you give because you can't give anything you don't got. Are you listening to me? I said that in very good English <laughs> so you would understand it. You can't give what you don't got. And if you want to know what you have, start looking at what you're giving. If you want to know what you're authoring, start looking at what you're giving. If you want to know what you're about and what makes you up, start looking at what you're giving. And if you're giving strife and you're giving discord, if you're giving anxiety and you're giving heartache and you're giving despair and you're giving agony and you're giving all these kind of things, maybe that's because that's being authored in your life. It's time we took back from the devil the God-given gift of forgiveness. And we start living out of that forgiveness. And then we start applying that forgiveness in how we live our lives to others and in others and for others. Dr. Yarborough says healthy, healthy rhythms indicate a healthy life. So let me ask you, is your life healthy? There's some practical things that we can do here, okay? 
First of all, we can start structuring our life in a little more healthy way. Our sleep, how much sleep we get, how, how much we're awake. Listen, you know what? I'm a, I'm a football fan. By the way, I just want to say this. This is a side note. It, it, I, I just need to say it. It doesn't matter who and what team and whose fan you are. You need to pray for Tua. He had a devastating injury. He's a brother of faith. And whether you like it or not, he's our brother. He's part of our family. And we need to lift him up. And we need to pray for him. It's just a side note. Okay. Now, to go back on this other thing. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a football fan. I love football. But at night, when they have a late game on, and it might be a good one. And Tennessee could even be playing. And they could even be possibly winning. <laughs> Miracles do exist. Okay. When it comes 10 or 10.30, that's my late time. Usually I go to bed at 9.30 or 10. But 10 or 10.30 is my late phase. I may stay up to 10 or 10.30, but guess what? 10 or 10.30, I cut the TV off and I go to bed. Why? Because that's a healthy rhythm for me. And I will not allow a ball game to rob that healthy rhythm from me. Are you listening to me? It's, it's a structure. It's a structure. I eat, try to eat healthier food. Last night I ate turkey sandwiches instead of ham. <laughs> that turkey was amazing. That turkey was amazing, I'm going to tell you. And I didn't eat the ham. Not to never have a ham sandwich, but last night, I chose turkey. I gobbled it down. <laughs> and it was good. Try to eat, boy. I've tried to reintroduce exercise into my life. Wake up in the morning, get on a treadmill, try to walk 30 minutes, do 25 push-ups. I do 25 crunches. I do 25 leg lifts, each leg sideways up and down when I get through I'm ready to go back to bed <laughs> go down take a shower and then I rest have quiet time and get the coffee made and after my quiet time I go in wake up my wife and I always have a prayer with her as she's getting up and waking up and I pray for her and pray for the day blessings and I sit down and have about 15 minutes of coffee with her and talking with her in the morning then I go to the diner and check on the diner and see how everybody's doing there and making sure that no fires to put out. And then after I go to the diner, I go to church and start my day. That's a rhythm. I do it every day. Every day. Just about every day. What kind of rhythms do you have that promotes health and promote, promotes gratitude to come back into your life? Let me, let me, it's quickly, I, quickly. We're going to be here till one thirty anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, I just introduced exercise back into my life because I got, went through some health issues and I didn't feel like exercising and stuff like that. And I've been doing it for about a month now, right? Something like that. I tell her, I don't know if it's making any difference or not. And I go like that and she goes, oh yes, honey, it is. I tell you, I know it. I'm just wanting to see if you understand that, that, that it is. You think I'm kidding. <laughs> but <laughs> we have fun at our house, okay? Because we just let the truth be the truth, you know, all right? And so, before I started this exercise thing a little bit, I wasn't feeling good, okay? Depressed, sleepy all the time. And I was just barely making it through the day. And I wondered what in the world was going on with me. I was feeling a little anxious. And there was really nothing to cause that. I had nothing to be anxious for. I really didn't. But see, I got out of balance and out of rhythm. And you don't have to do much. I mean, I, my son, is he's on the powerlifting team at Auburn. And last week they had a meet, and he won first in his class. I'm proud of it. Okay. He's got a, yeah, I'm proud of it. He's got a, he's got a picture of him posing, you know. And he looks like I look, but just a little taller. And got them big muscles in his arms and stuff, and I, I was so proud, you know. It just, just wonderful. But 
You know, I knew that uh, he, I wasn't going to be him. You know, I'm nearly 60 years old. I, I wasn't going to be a power lifter. I wasn't going to compete and stuff, but I wanted to feel good. I wanted to be better than I was. So I incorporated this exercise program back into my life. And when I did, honestly, after I get through, take the shower and stuff, I feel great for a moment. Y'all listen, y'all caught that, right? And, and, and then about 8 o'clock, 8.30, I feel kind of bad again. But I didn't have that moment before. Are y'all understanding what I'm saying? I got that moment. And moments are precious. We think sometimes that we only have validation to change little things in our life if it changes our whole life. And we don't seek the moments. The moments are what's special. Amen. The moments that you feel good, the moments that you have with loved ones, the moments that you share that, in, that encouragement, the moments. Moments are what drive us. Moments are what carry us. Moments are the ones that we just really seek and want. You don't have to change something so it'll change your life completely. It may eventually, but those moments are precious. What's preventing you to make some small change that will give you a moment this week? What can you do to take some time to change your rhythm that would produce a moment of and let gratitude surface? What would prevent you? There's only one thing that I can think of that would prevent you. Y'all know what it is? You. You. May God grant us the wisdom and the strength and the fortitude to make those small changes, changes that will produce moments and moments and moments through changes and changes and changes that one day we can say we have been transformed by the power and the authority of God that's given us the ability through His forgiveness to understand joy, peace, and love. And gratitude. Would you bow your heads? Thank you, Lord, for our day together, our time together, our talk. Thank you for your spirit that is so needed in our world today. A spirit of gratitude, a spirit of humbleness, a spirit of thankfulness. So, Lord, today we submit our request to you, praying, Lord, that you will help us in our endeavor that our lives will be transformed into your image more and more each day. We pray this now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Are you glad you came to church today? Amen. I'm glad you did too. Thanks for watching. We would love for you to connect with us online. On our website, you will find up-to-date information about everything happening around here. Look for us on Facebook and Instagram. And please, download our free app on your smartphone or tablet. We are so glad you're here and we hope you enjoy your friendship experience.